What's going on YouTube? My name is Jasmine. On today's episode of The Slam Project, we're going to be talking about 14-year-old Lori Casper. She disappeared in 1976 from the Edmonton area and has never been seen or heard from since. And I'm also going to talk about the murder of a man named Gordon Sanderson. He was found dead in the same area in 1977, and he was known as Septic Tank Sam for 44 years. And if you would like to see more videos on missing and murdered Indigenous people, click that subscribe button and the notification bell. Now let's get right into it. Lori Kasprick was born in 1961 and often used the nickname Lovey. She was one of seven siblings. She was the second oldest after her brother Rick. The children were being raised by their dad after he separated from their mother. Lori is of Métis descent from her mother's side. The family moved from Winnipeg around the year 1975 to Hilliard, Alberta which is about 80 kilometers east of Edmonton. Lori would start to run away for a few days at a time after the move to the Edmonton area. Her dad or the RCMP would usually find her and bring her home. Aside from living in Hilliard, Lori attended school in Mundare, which is about 10 kilometers to the east. Her family still possesses her school ID for the 1975 to 1976 school year. In the spring of 1976, when Lori was 14 years old, she would leave home and never return. In May or June of that year, her brother Rick saw her for the last time. He remembers that he had a track meet and she showed up. They chatted for a bit and then she had to leave. That is all Rick remembers. He doesn't know if she was with anyone or if someone was waiting for her. Before Lori disappeared, she would often visit her Aunt Mavis, who also lived in the area, and also her grandparents lived in the town of Holden. It is often wondered if she met friends in the Holden area when she visited her grandparents. Lori would speak to her family for the last time around Christmas time in 1976. She had called them on the phone and said that she was working as a model in the Lake Tahoe area of Nevada. Her family does not know if she was telling the truth. She still could have been in the area, but said this to make them stop looking for her. Her brother Rick says that he remembers his dad asking Lori when she was coming home. Since Lori was only 14, she more than likely had older friends or a boyfriend who helped her as a runaway. She had been gone for a little over six months by this time. That is a long time to be out on your own with no money, job, or place of your own. Rick then remembers that the RCMP told his dad that Lori was 16 now and could legally do what she wants. They then told him that they would bring her back if they ever ran into her. That never happened. Lori's family eagerly awaited her return throughout the years. Her brother Rick considered hiring a private detective but it was too expensive. The PI told him that locating missing women can be difficult because they marry and change their last names. In the decades that passed since Lori disappeared, Rick would often stop by and speak to the RCMP to ask about his sister. He also spoke to Red Cross social workers and started to look online when the internet came around. Still, there was no trace of Lori. In 2006, after Lori had been missing for 30 years, her family was contacted by the RCMP. They wanted to know if they had any items that might contain her DNA. They were investigating the Robert Picton case and wanted to compare her DNA to bone fragments found on his property. The family supplied some items and there was no match. Lori's DNA was now at least in the database. Unfortunately, Lori's dad would also die in 2006. I am not sure if it was before or after a DNA sample was requested. He carried Lori's school ID in his wallet until the day he died. In 2013, her file was returned to the Toefield RCMP, where she was originally reported as missing in 1976. Since her case is so old, there is no paper or internet trail. Sergeant Doug Coleman started with the RCMP in 1978. 
Before he retired in 2015, he began to investigate Lori's case. He interviewed about 80 people that were either family or friends. He stated that some people he talked to did not even know that Lori was missing. He did not learn much more other than a couple other pieces of information. Number one, Lori possibly hung out at a park on Jasper Avenue in downtown Edmonton. Number two, she was spotted on a bus in Winnipeg in 1977. Lori was from Winnipeg and used to hang out near Portage and Maine. I do think these sightings in Edmonton and Winnipeg are credible, but the passage of time is working against this case. Investigating this case is difficult because anything known about her case comes directly from someone's memory years and decades after she disappeared. The Winnipeg sighting could have happened before she moved away. But if she really was there after she ran away from home, how did she get there and who did she see when she was there? Did anyone else see her besides the person who spotted her on the bus? There was speculation that Lori Kasprick was a woman named Lori Kennedy who committed suicide in Longview, Texas in 2010. She had lived under an assumed name and her real identity wasn't discovered until almost six years after her death. Her real name was Kimberly Maria McLean. Lori would be about 62 years old in 2023. She has a large scar on her forehead above her right eye. Before she disappeared, she talked about going to either Calgary or the United States. There are two Jane Doe's that could possibly be a match for Lori. One is in Canada's missing person and unidentified data bank, and the other is not. I am not too familiar with the Canadian database, but it was established in 2017. And the database does not say whether there is DNA on file for the missing and unidentified people listed. Even if these Jane Doe's are not Lori, this video is a great place to get them the coverage they need. On April 8, 1979, a human skull with attached vertebrae was found in Banff National Park. Two hikers discovered the skull 200 yards north of the Trans-Canada Highway near 40 Mile Creek. It is said that the skull was not fully decomposed because there were still bits of hair and skin present and the lower jaw was missing. It is believed that she had been dead for one or two years prior. Placing time of death in either winter of 1977 and most likely the winter of 1978. Additional searches of the area by Banff and Calgary RCMP turned up several ribs, a leg bone, and right shoulder blade. For measurements of the bones, it is believed that Jane Doe was close to being around 5 foot 2 to 5 feet 3 inches tall. The hair found on the skull was thick and there were high cheekbones. This led investigators to believe that the deceased was a mixture of Caucasian and native. This is the textbook definition of Métis, which is what Lori is considered to be. It is not exactly known how Bath Jane Doe died, but there was no clothing found with the remains. Investigators also ruled out suicide because they said they did not find a note. But not everyone who commits suicide leaves a note. And they also do not believe she got lost or injured in the forest because she was found not very far off the main highway. The last bit of information leads me to question if this could be Lori or not. Investigators have said that the teeth were quote unquote perfect, so dental records proved useless. Lori had crooked teeth. So does the description of perfect mean that the teeth were straight or that there were no cavities or dental work? They have never posted a picture of the structure of Jane Doe's upper teeth. If you know of or heard of someone missing from the Calgary area in the late 1970s, please pass along information about Banff Jane Doe. The closest First Nation to where her remains were found is the Stony Nakoda. The second Jane Doe was found in Edmonton on June 11, 1976, 
and she was referred to as the Edmonton Jane Doe. She was found in the Parkdale area of the city in someone's backyard. She is listed in the Canadian Missing and Unidentified Database, but it does not say if there is DNA on file. She is described as 30 to 40 years old and 5 feet 4 inches tall. Remember that facial, age, and height are estimates and are not always correct. And this is the only information out there for this Jane Doe. Another person went missing around the same time Lori did and was found in the same area she lived with her family. His name was Gordon Sanderson and he was known as Septic Tank Sam for 44 years. He was found on April 13, 1977 on an abandoned farm near Tofield, Alberta. Tofield at the time had a population of about 1,200 and is about 30 miles southeast of Edmonton. A man named Charlie McLeod was building a new farmhouse and needed a septic pump. So he decided to go back to his old farmhouse a few miles down the road to retrieve the old pump out of the septic tank. The farmhouse had been abandoned since he moved his family to their new property about two years prior. When he opened up the septic tank, he first saw a sock, then a shoe, and then a body attached to the shoe. He raced to the Tofield RCMP to report what he had found. When the RCMP arrived, they began to scoop out the liquid of the six-foot septic tank with an old bucket. This took them about six hours. This John Doe at the time was first tortured in the most heinous way. He was beaten, shot twice, and burned with a butane torch in several places. There were several burn patches on his sleeves, pant legs, and socks. The crotch area of his pants was cut with a tool that was strong enough to cut through the zipper, something like farming shears. His private area was also cut and slashed. He was then wrapped in a yellow bed sheet. The ends were tied with nylon rope and he was covered in lime before he was dumped headfirst into the septic tank. He was so badly decomposed that it could not be determined if he was male or female or if he was even alive when all this happened to him. Investigators also thought that he had been in the tank for up to a year. Lori went missing around the spring or early summer of 1976 and was last heard from in December 1976. So this would be around the same time Gordon had been murdered. Residents in the area were spooked by this vicious murder. Other homeowners began checking their septic tanks to make sure there were no other victims. They also wondered if the person or persons who did this were local. The farmhouse was only about 50 yards from a well-traveled dirt road. Did the person who dumped Gordon know the place was abandoned? Or did they just stumble across the place when they were looking for a dump site? Gordon may have never been found if Charlie McLeod never went looking for his old pump. And remember during all this, Gordon was still unidentified. The RCMP were baffled over this murder. They had no idea who Gordon was or who killed him. They had initially thought he was Caucasian. They sent his dentals to every dentist in Alberta and eventually published them nationally in the Canadian Dental Association magazine. They never got any tips from this. Throughout the years, investigators remained haunted by this gruesome murder and published several news articles about the case in the local newspapers. A couple of different clay models were constructed of Gordon, and it was then believed that he was of native origin. In 2012, a partial DNA profile was obtained from a hair sample, but there were no hits. It was run again in 2019 against Canada's newly formed National Children, Missing Person, and Unidentified Database. Again, there were no hits. With advancements in genetic genealogy, a DNA lab in Texas called Othram was contacted to see if they could help extract a full DNA profile and build a family tree. Othram has developed techniques to extract human DNA from severely degraded and contaminated samples. 
They agreed to help the RCMP and they were successful. The DNA from bone samples were uploaded to a public database and potential relatives were identified. With this information, the RCMP were able to identify Gordon's sister, Joyce Sanderson, and get confirmation by comparing her DNA to his. And in June 2021, it was officially announced that the man RCMP dubbed Seth the Tank Sam was in fact Gordon Sanderson. Gordon was known as Gordy to his family and friends. It was learned that Gordon was a 60 scoop survivor. He had been taken from his family at age nine. The 60s scoop was an era in Canada where indigenous children were taken from their families and placed in foster care. This was happening before the 1960s, but it is often referred to as the 60s scoop because that is when it was most prevalent. Some people compared the 60s scoop to residential schools because the goal was the same. When Gordon grew up, he struggled with addictions and trouble with the law. He eventually reconnected with his birth family. Gordon lived in Edmonton during the 1970s and he had a daughter before he died. His family last heard from him when he made plans to meet up with his brother in Calgary. He never made it there and his sister Joyce wondered what happened to him. She was finally able to report him missing in the early 1980s but the connection was never made to the remains found in the septic tank. Police think that he was killed by criminals he knew. Lori Kasprick also mentioned the possibility of going to Calgary before she went missing. Did she know Gordon or did they know the same people? Another possibility is that Gordon could have been hitchhiking and picked up by a person who hated native people. Lori also could have been picked up by the same person. Her DNA has never had any hits in the DNA databank, but her brother Rick still holds out hope that she is still alive. He understands if she does not wish to make contact, but he just wants to know if she is okay. If you have any information about these cases, or remember Lori Kasprick or Gordon Sanderson around the time they went missing, please contact your local RCMP office. Any small amount of information might be important. Thank you so much for watching today's video. And if you knew Lori or Gordon, please share any memories of them. And I will see you in my next video.